in short. Okay. Right. Uh, today we are going to be looking at un chapter four from your textbook, the first section of that, which is chemical analysis. Chemical analysis is how we figure out what different things are made of. There's a few terms that you need to be aware of. The first terms that you need to be aware of, and these are things that you will have looked at earlier on in your uh, schooling, is the difference between something which is pure and impure. So in everyday language, something which is pure is normally something which is natural, uh, something which hasn't had anything added to it. So you might say that milk is something which is pure, whereas something that's impure would be something that's got something added to it. So chocolate milk, for example, might be impure. Similarly, you might say that um, water straight out of a tap is pure, but if you've added ribena uh, or some other squash to that, then you'd say that that's impure. For a chemist, though, the words pure and impure are quite different. Um, pure for, in chemistry means it's made of only one type of substance. And impure means it's a mixture of different types of substance. So pure water in chemistry isn't tap water. Because in tap water you've got all sorts of minerals. You've got calcium, you've got magnesium, you've got all sorts of minerals. They're good for you. They, you know, they're health, healthy for your bones and for your growth and stuff like that. But it, it means it's not pure. It means it's got other stuff than water in it. So pure water is just distilled water where we've uh, boiled it and then condensed it and we just end up with nothing but water. Whereas impure is when the water's had something added to it. That contrasts to more modern things, and specifically things called formulations. So a formulation is basically anything which has uh, complex ingredients. So for example, I've got some lovely Sainsbury's basic Basics mouthwash <laughs> over here, and you can see on the back it's got loads of ingredients. And you'll see the same thing on your deodorant at home, or makeup, or all sorts of different things. Uh, and in your syllabus, it says explicitly the ones you need to be aware of. So formulations include fuels, so like petrol and the things that fuel cars, cleaning agents, paints, medicines, alloys, fertilizers, and foods. So all of those are formulations. They have lots and lots of ingredients, and each of the ingredients does a different thing. They're all important, they all do different things. You don't need to know any of those ingredients off by heart, but you, all you need to be aware of is the fact that some things have lots of ingredients, each of those ingredients does a different thing, and it's therefore called a formulation. Right, moving on. In terms of actual chemical analysis, how we figure out what things are, the first thing that we learn about is something called chromatography. Chromatography, you've done earlier down in the school, is simply the process of separating out constituents from a mixture. And normally, we do things like inks or food colouring. It's set up very simply. You have a piece of filter paper and you have a beaker. On your filter paper, you put a pencil line. It has to be pencil. I'll explain why it's got to be pencil a bit later on. Just like so. And then that's going to sit in your beaker. But let's say you want to test this black pen and you can do it with however many different colours or whatever you like. You take a dot of your pen and you put it on the line like so. This is then going to go into the beaker, but into the beaker you need to put some solvent. So in this case, we'll just use water. Water is the most common solvent for paper chromatography, but you also might see um, people using ethanol as a solvent. And I'm gonna screw that up because I put in the water too high. And you can actually see what's happened there, that because the water line is higher than my pencil line, my ink spot has just come straight out of solution. So what you're supposed to do, and if I had been more careful, that's what I would have done, is the water line is supposed to stop underneath and that's to stop all of this ink dissolving out into the water. What you do notice though, is that the pencil line doesn't move at all, doesn't change. That's because the pencil is not soluble in the water, doesn't dissolve in the water. So as the water comes up the paper, the pencil doesn't go anywhere. That's why it has to be in pencil line. If you do it in pen, that will just smudge and go out into the water and it'll ruin your experiment. So you have to use pencil. The solvent line has to then be below this pencil line. Now what happens over time is that the water creeps up the paper and it starts to drag the ink with it. But what you can see is that the ink starts to separate into different colours. And here's what I made earlier. <laughs> we've got this one here that we did earlier, where we've started with three different inks. Now what's happened, this one's dry, so you can't see the water, but as the water rises up, the ink dissolves into the water and gets carried up the paper by it. But what you can see is that each of these ink spots is made of different colours. So if we look at this one first, we can see that it's made of a blue and it's made of a purple. The blue is more soluble than the purple. It dissolves more readily 
than the purple and that's why it travels further up it likes to be in the water and it travels really easily with the water whereas the purple here doesn't dissolve as well in the water so it travels more slowly and if you look at this one which i imagine was this a black one yeah so the middle one was a black one so it's got blues and it's got reds and it's got some greenish yellow it's got another small spot there of what looks like a purplish color and then blue up here but what you can see is that this blue dissolves the easiest because it travels the furthest Whereas down here at the bottom, I've got another smudge from what looks like another shade of blue, and that's barely travelled at all. And here I've got yellows and reds and a bit of pink. Was this an orange pen? That was a brown one. A brown pen? Mm -hmm. uh, what, a light brown? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yellows and oranges and reds, and you can see those colours split up there nicely. Now what this means is that each of these ink spots was not a pure substance. It was an impure substance. It was a mixture of different colours. So this brown one was a mixture of yellows and reds. And this, was this purple? Yeah. Uh, yes, that was a purple. And the purple pink. one here was a mixture of a kind of a pink and a blue as well. And the black is a mixture of five or six different colours. So this is a really nice way to show that things are pure or impure. We can analyse this really nicely. And you won't get examples that are this complicated in your exam. In your exam, what they'll do is they'll show you... I'll just do it on, on this piece of paper here. They'll give you a picture of a chromatogram like this, and there'll be the pencil line at the bottom. And there'll be spots all along it. So they'll have started from, say, three ink spots like that, and it'll separate into spots like this. And they'll ask you questions like, for example, if we call this one A, and this one B, and this one C, they'll say, um, which of A, B, and C is a pure substance? Now, looking at those, we can see that the only one is B, because B is made of one thing. A is made of three, and C is made of two. They might say to you, what substances are shared between these things? And then you can say, well, B shares something with A. So A, the second spot here, is shared with B. And that's particularly useful in um, doing analysis when you're comparing one thing to another. So you might say, right, I've got this new food colouring, I don't know what's in it. So what you'd do is you'd put that new food colouring on B, and you'd put a food colouring that you know about on A, and then you see where they travel, and you see if they match up, and you say, right, well, I know that what's in B is also in A. And that's also a fairly common type of thing to be asked about. They will also ask you to calculate something called an RF value. An RF value is simply a ratio of how far it's travelled. So you let your, chroma, your chromatogram go, and you let the experiment go, and you let all your colours run. And then at a certain point, you pull it out. And what you then need to do is you need to look at where the solvent front is. The solvent front is where the water has got up to. So in this case, you might say, well, I might have noticed that the water got up to that point. And in my example here, I might have noticed that the water has got up to this point. To calculate an RF value, you need to work out a ratio of how far the spot has travelled relative to the solvent front. So we use a very simple formula. The formula is RF equals distance travelled by spot divided by the solvent front, and it will come out as an answer between 0 and 1. So in this example, what I'll do is I'll say, well, hang on, let's see. I'm looking at, say, this one for B. I can see that my solvent front is uh, 70.2 centimetres. So in this case, I have not 70.2 centimetres, so millimetres. So I've got 70... 7.2 centimetres is my solvent front. And I want to know how far this particular spot has travelled. And I'm going to turn this around so it's not in millimetres to confuse me again. And I'm going to go from the middle of the spot, and I'm going to see that that's uh, 4.6. So I'm going to do 4.6 divided by 7.2 to give me my RF value. Which comes out as 0.64. 
and that's my RF value. Then what I could do is I could say, right, well, I've worked out the RF value for my spot, and I know what the solvent was. What I can do is I can go into a big textbook, and I can say, well, if I want to know what my spot is, I can look at all the chemicals that have already been tested, find out what their RF value is, and look that up. So, for example, if I think that that chemical is E100, a particular food colouring, what I'll do is I'll then go into the book, and I'll see, well, what's the RF value for E100? And if it's 0.64, then I'm pretty confident that what I've got is E100. If in the book it tells me that E100 is 0.78, then I know that I'm talking about a different thing. So that's your RF value. So we've so far looked at pure and impure substances, and then what a formulation is. And then chromatography is a way of separating out and figuring out if something is pure. Another way of figuring out something is pure is by looking at its melting point or boiling point. Pure water has a very, very precise boiling point, 100 degrees. And if you've got pure distilled water, it's going to boil at 100 degrees. But impure water is going to have a range of boiling points. So it's going to boil between, say, 92 and 100 degrees. And the same applies for any other substance. If it's pure, it'll have a very specific, very sharp melting point or boiling point. Whereas if it's not a pure substance, if it's an impure substance, it'll be a broad range. What they might do to you in the exam is they'll give you a table of substances and they'll say what the boiling points are in one column and they'll say, oh, this one's got a boiling point of between 23 and 28 degrees. Is it pure or impure? And then you know that it's impure. So that's one way to separate them out. We need to look at some gas tests now. And again, this is all part of chemical analysis. It's about finding out what we have in front of us. It's trying to establish what the chemical we have in front of us is. And there are four gases that we need to test for. We've got to test for hydrogen gas, which is H2. We need to test for oxygen gas, which is O2. For carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and for chlorine, which is Cl2. Now, we've generated a lot of these in advance to make life easier, but in an exam, they might talk to you about the gas being generated and then how you test it. So we'll start with hydrogen, which Mr. Orr has prepared for us in a vial. Um, we're hoping that Fingers it's crossed. Stayed. Sorry? Hopefully. Yeah, we're hoping that it's worked out. I'm just going to put my goggles on. If it doesn't, we'll just generate some more. It's fairly straightforward. I'm just going to light my splint. And with any luck, when I pop this in, we'll see a small chemical reaction. That worked very nicely. So what we've got there, I'm just going to get a mat for this. No problem. What we've got there is what's called the squeaky pop reaction. And what you do is you take a lighted splint and you see if you get a squeaky pop. So lighted splint. Squeaky with an A on it. I think it has an A. Yeah. Squeaky pop. And that is the technical name for it, so you don't need to worry about it. As in using a word that looks like it's unscientific, that is the name for it. It's called the squeaky pop test. Now, normally in an exam, the reaction that you use to generate hydrogen is going to be metal plus an acid. So you'd use a metal plus an acid, and we've learned all about these, and you get your metal salt plus hydrogen. And you test, well, do I have hydrogen here? Okay, you use a lighted splint, do you get squeaky pop? Yes or no? All right, next up we've got oxygen. Uh, okay, and let me get it all ready. So generate oxygen gas, we've got oxygen in the atmosphere all around us, but it's mixed up with loads of nitrogen as well. So only 20% of the air around us is oxygen. If we want to try and get more concentrated, or sorry, a greater volume of oxygen in the amount of space that we've got, we can use a chemical reaction involving hydrogen peroxide. And what we've got here is manganese, one of the manganese oxides. So this is manganese 4 oxide. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour my peroxide in. 
and you'll be able to see a chemical reaction starting pretty soon. And there's a gas being given off, and then we take a glowing splint. So this is one that's just been blown out, and we pop that in and it lights again. Because what's happening is, when I blow it out, it's not colliding with enough oxygen. We looked at rates of reaction, it's not colliding with enough oxygen to stay lit. The reaction can't keep itself going. But when I pop it in here, there's enough oxygen for the reaction to really get going again. And then I blow it out and start it again really nicely. So it's a really nice little chemical reaction there. And in the technical language that we use there, this oxygen relights a glowing split. And in reality, any reaction that you do with oxygen, so if I'm burning magnesium in oxygen, so you get a nice big bright white light, if you did that in pure oxygen, I, if I did that in the air just here, I'd get a nice bright white light. If I did that in pure oxygen, I'd get a massive white light. So again, in an exam, if they say to you the reaction is, can, the reaction is done in an area where there is pure oxygen, you're expecting a much more vigorous reaction. Next up is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, we have something called the lime water test. Right, we'll need one more boiling tube. Right, we'll just use the hydrogen one. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a little chemical reaction that will generate some carbon dioxide. Now the standard reaction here is to use hydrochloric acid and a metal carbonate. When we studied acids, we learned about how that makes a metal salt, water, but it also makes carbon dioxide. I'm going to be careful because I'm not measuring things out properly, so I could get more gas than I've bargained for. And I'm just going to I'm just going to get some of my calcium carbonate here, and I'm going to pop it in there, and you can see that chemical reaction starts. I've probably not put enough in, but you can see the reaction is generating a gas over there because it's fizzing and bubbling and all of that gas is traveling through and coming into the lime water. I'm just shaking it to make it go really nice and quick. And with any luck, it's slowly getting there. the waiting game. Yeah. Probably because you've got air in the delivery tube. Yeah, I've got to force all of that air out first. And uh, it's slowly working. Oh yeah, it's there we go. Air. What's happening is you can see that the lime water is turning cloudy or milky. It's going very nice and white there. And what that is, is the carbon dioxide that's coming off of this reaction is reacting with the lime water. And it's making calcium carbonate, which is the chalk and it's got tiny, tiny, tiny particles in there. And that's what's making it cloudy because there's a solid in there now. So that's your test for carbon dioxide. That it turns lime water milky. And I just want to check, and I'm pretty sure that's the exact word that your syllabus uses, because there's always some confusion about what exact word you should be using. Yeah, so they use milky or cloudy. So they've got milky. So it turns lime water milky, and then in your syllabus and brackets it says that's cloudy. It's really important that you remember the way that works, because what a lot of students do in an exam is the question will be, well, how, test, you know, how do you know that carbon dioxide has been given off here, or how would you test the gas? A lot of people say you'd add lime water, but that's not what you do, you don't add lime water you bubble the gas through the lime water. So you have some lime water and you get the gas to travel through the lime water, and then if it goes milky, which is also called cloudy, then you know you've got carbon dioxide present, but otherwise you don't. All right, the final test that we're gonna do is for the presence of chlorine. We'll just use the blue litmus. So yeah, I wasn't sure which one you'd needed, so. Blue litmus should be fine. Now we've collected some chlorine before into a jar and you can see that it's a nice yellow gas. 
chlorine is toxic, which is why we're doing it in the fume cupboards. It's why also I'm not bothering to, I want it to go nice and quickly as well, which is why I'm not generating any live for you while we did it earlier. I'm gonna just take some litmus paper, some blue litmus paper. Now you guys have learned already that if I take blue litmus paper and put it in acid, it turns red. But you can see also when I put it in chlorine, it turns white, it bleaches white. Okay, so the test for chlorine is that it bleaches damp litmus. So we'll just write that up on the board and then we're done. Okay, so you take the litmus paper, uh, yeah, so you take the damp litmus paper, you put it in, and it turns it nice and white. And that's how you know that you've got your chlorine. Thanks very much, that's a lot.